دوسرے سیشن کی طرف جس میں پروفیسر سید عرفان حبیب صاحب کا ایک خصوصی لیکچر ہے اس کے لیے میں درخواست کرتا ہوں سر پہ تشریف لائیں اس سیشن کی صدارت پروفیسر سجاد صاحب کریں گے میں آپ سے بھی درخواست کرتا ہوں سر آپ تشریف لائیں اس سیشن کا جو عنوان ہے مولانا آزاد اے لائف ان اسٹرگل فار اے کمپوزٹ اینڈ پلورسٹ انڈیا اب میں پروفیسر سجاد صاحب کو ہینڈ اوور کرتا ہوں سر آپ آگے کی کاروائی کریں آپ چیئر کریں گے آپ کی کاروائی کریں begin with the apologies again for the delay in the morning and uh, for keeping me waiting but anyway now we are did ahead of that uh, morning phase and uh, i'm supposed to talk about uh, the book which we have uh, about which we have talked about since uh, morning the last two hours um let me the title of the lecture i have given that we will keep in mind but i would like to stick to what i have done in the book because that is more important introducing the book emphasizing pluralism which i have set in the title as well the idea of doing a book like this was first because there was no book on moran azad since professor vien datta's book in 1989 90 which was one good book which came out at least i consider it to be one of the best ones uh, on manal azad which had its own limitations but it was a beautiful book but since then few books came out but they were all they were all very incomplete and they were not really uh, worthwhile second issue uh, for me for doing this book was that uh, i came across because i engage with media i also uh, do other things besides uh, my historical research so i came across lots of comments and commentaries which were very toxic about maulana azad which were part of the sort of climate we are living in for the last few years where people were saying that maulana azad was actually a really trait person because he was somebody who never went to a college never had a degree never had a certificate you know and uh, the education we have today the education system it is in a mess because it had a very messy beginning it had messy beginning because we had somebody like maulana azad who were not educated himself who took over the reins of uh, education as the indian independent government so one could have ignored it because these are all things which keep happening but i thought let us take it seriously at least it, it will give me an opportunity to to engage with maulana azad learn more about him because as a student of history i have been reading maulana azad as part of uh, freedom struggle over the years but never got a chance to uh, to engage with maulana's work uh, seriously third was the marana azad chair which i was invited to join for 10 years and as part of it i organized lots of seminars conferences plays by tom alter late tom alter dear friend of ours who engaged with marana in a very theatrical way and uh, i know some of you must have seen his solo play so that all that put together inspired me to take this project forward now the task was to to understand him in diverse ways as somebody said in the morning that maulana azad was not just a freedom fighter maulana was a 
Islamic scholar, was a journalist, was a nationalist, was a philosopher, uh, was, uh, and if somebody has read Hubari Khatir, we can also say he was an amateur ornithologist, uh, he was, a, he was a, a promoter of music, and he was a connoisseur of tea. So, so many things, and these are not very light comments. These are, these are Maulana, for Maulana, these were very serious affairs, and I will talk, talk about them while I while I carry on. So, we can begin with, and that's how that's how I begin the book. That Maulana ki apni asli, jo apni zindagi hai, wo kaise shuru hoti hai, aur Maulana ka ka jo taluk hai Islam se. वो वो उनकी पैदाइश से है क्योंकि वो ऐसे घर में पैदा हुए जहां मौलाना खैरुद्दीन उनके वालिद एक बड़े इस्लामिक स्कॉलर थे अरब में रहते थे अरब में सऊदी अरेबिया में नहीं उस वक्त अरब था ये सऊदी अरेबिया मैंने किताब में एक छोटा सा कमेंट भी किया है कि दुनिया का अकेला मुल्क है जिसमें एक एक फैमिली का नाम किसी मुल्क के साथ जोड़ा गया है तो इज अ पर्सनल फीवडम ऑफ ऑफ द इब्न सऊद एंड हिज फैमिली it continues like that. Anyway, to Arabia me pada hue, mai rahe saat aat saal ki umar tak usme thode controversy hai ki aat saal ki umar thi ye bilote ya saat saal ki jo bhi the. Unki mother tongue Arabic hai kyunki unki walada Arab thi. Jab Maulana Khairuddin kyunki Delhi ke rehne wale the, aur ye bahut ye bhi bahut kam log jante hain. कि दिल्ली से भी कनेक्शन मौलाना का है मौलाना का कनेक्शन डायरेक्ट फैमिली का कनेक्शन दिल्ली से है अठारह से कुछ साल पहले उनकी फैमिली माइग्रेट की क्योंकि पढ़े लिखे जो मुसलमान थे वो अठारह से पहले एक मायूसी का दौर था जब वो देखते थे ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के आने के बाद मुगलिया दौर ख़त्म हो रहा है पेट ख़त्म हो जाएगी तो लार्ज नंबर ऑफ पीपल वर माइग्रेटिंग टू टू डिफरेंट पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड एजुकेटेड पीपल माइग्रेटेड टू हिजाज most of them who were oriented uh, towards uh, or focused towards religion in particular so his family decided to go to uh, go to hijaz maulana khairuddin his father studied there was brought up there married there and had very close connections with the ottoman rulers because whole arab world was part of the ottoman empire and that was a period, and this is important to say, and I have pointed out in the book also, and written a separate section on it, uh, because which is important in today's context of Islam as well and politics. Maulana uh, Khairuddin, Maulana's father, was close to Ottoman uh, rulers and nobility. He was even given scholarship. He spent a couple of years in Constantinople, Istanbul. Now, most of the time was spent in the libraries. And uh, somebody was talking about the library, the, the location of this place. Library and books have a very important place in Maulana's life. And I will refer to that later on. And not only Maulana, but Maulana's father he spent most of his life in the libraries, all over the Muslim world in particular. Now. While he was there, Maulana was watching as a young, as a child, how his father was reacting to things around him. One important thing which uh, is noticeable is the antipathy of Maulana Khairuddin towards Wahhabism, towards Wahhabiyat, which was which was something very important in those times. Saudi Arabia was not Saudi Arabia till then. There was a struggle going on between the Ottoman Empire and Abdul Wahab and his forces and Ibn Saud combined. One of the most toxic combinations in Islam, Islamic world, you know, which has done lots of things which have messed up our lives uh, all over the world. And that was a period of struggle going on in those days. Maulana Khairuddin was e extremely uh, indifferent and apathetic or uh, against the rise of Wahhabism, wrote 
uh, took up a project of t- multiple multi volume project on on wahhabism people asked him to do it he could finish only two volumes which are not available even now but that there is a record that he wrote two volumes later on he goes through a little uh, problem in his life he f- fell down broke his breaks his leg people suggest that you should go to india for your surgery or whatever whatever was available in those times he comes to calcutta where he meets large number of people the, he had so many murids in calcutta because his name and fame has reached that far finally uh, some rich people of like this is a question people asked why, if he was from delhi why did he come to calcutta uh, he could have come to delhi that was his place to to come in but he decided to come to calcutta because large number of surti uh, traders rich people they assured him that we will look after him give him a house to live look after everything all facilities etc you come and settle down in calcutta so the family migrated to calcutta in 1895 96 and that is the time when morana was 7 or 8 year old so from here on his education begins and which is important he is not allowed to go to any school any madrasa because uh, morana khairuddin was very indifferent towards the quality of education given in the madrasas he has written extensively that the madrasas in india are not worth worth sending their your your children to they are backward they have no idea of education they don't teach anything anything worthwhile and there was a fear that his son may get exposed to wahhabism you know this is something so so important for maulana khairuddin that he so he used to teach himself then he appointed teachers those teachers were interviewed by maulana khairuddin first and he used to test what is the understanding of islam of that particular teacher if he was convinced then he was allowed to to continue as a teacher of maulana so so this went on for for the early period but maulana himself was a very very serious student very precocious child a very intelligent one very very extraordinary and somebody who could finish off all his courses at home which were taught to him at the age of 12 that's what maulana has written in huware khatir also and in azad ki kahana kahani azad ki zubani that at the age of 12 he had finished almost all his courses which were taught at, at that time his person was so 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 good at the age of 12 that he began a project on a persian dictionary on on persian dictionary which was not continued for very long but he began a work at the age of 15 he began a paper called lisal ul sidq so so at the 15, at the age of 15 when he, the paper came out the paper became extremely extremely important and people were so impressed by the quality of work he did and something interesting was that when he was 15 he was invited to participate in a islamic conference in lahore so he traveled to lahore for the first time his fame as a editor of lisan al sidq has reached lahore before him so there were large number of people who expected maulana azad and wanted to meet him because meet the editor of uh, lisan al sidq because and when he reached and people introduced him to all the luminaries around altaf hussain hali was one of the people uh, around in those times he was an old man and uh, he was introduced to hali and uh, so he couldn't believe he said are you really azad are you the same person who is writing this paper so so he had he had to struggle to prove that he is actually azad so this was the reputation and the level of his scholarship that people couldn't even believe that he is the same person who is editing who is writing something like this 
So this is the background of the man. So one has to understand when we talk about Maulana Azad, we have to talk about him from this stage. You know, how how what was the level of Maulana Azad's scholarship? So you don't have to really look for degrees and certificates. Uh, these are all very trivial things. He was much beyond that. You know, he was uh, there was no no necessity or requirement of somebody like him who was an autodidact. Like somebody who taught himself all sorts of things, and I will talk talk about what he taught uh, taught himself a little later. Now, when we see all this, we find that Morana was in awe of his father, and uh, he scaled his father much above everybody else. That was a level of respect he had for him. Despite that, Maulana dissented from his father's idea of Islam, idea of the world. And I'm saying this because somebody who, who had such a huge respect for his father and father is father. But despite that, Maulana, even at the age of 10, 15, 16, 17, started questioning his own father. He started showing interest in the writings of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He used to read what Sir Sayyid has written or had been writing, Aligarh Institute Gazette, all sorts of writings of, of Sir Sayyid. He used to read quietly without his father being aware of it because he knew that if he comes to know then he is going to reprim reprimand him and that's what happened one day that he, when, when he was reading all all this stuff there was a struggle going on between in Maulana Azad's mind on the one side was Maulana Khairuddin his father and his scholarship his idea of Islam his idea of the world on the other hand was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan who was saying something else something different there was a puritanism of a Sufi, not a Chishti Sufi. Chishti Sufi is something else. He was a Qadiriya Naqshbandi Sufi, which is a Puritan Sufi order. That's where Kharuddin belonged. So in that dual world, Maulana Kharuddin or Maulana Azar was totally perplexed. He didn't know how to... So he was going through that phase. And his father one day noticed there is something wrong with the with the with the with the boy. He stopped him. He said, "Tell me what is your problem? You are not well. I don't see you as a normal normal child. You, you, I find you disturbed." He said, "No, everything is fine. No problem. You know, no, you are you are lying. You have to ex tell me what is the problem. What are you reading these days?" He asked a direct question. And Maulana said that I am reading Sir Sayyid. And Maulana Khairuddin, as expected, was so, so angry. He said, I have been telling you all these years, you have to keep away from, from that man's writings because that will destroy you as a, as a human being, as an Islamic uh, scholar. You will learn things which you shouldn't learn, all that. So he got a long, longish lesson, but that's what that's what that there's a th thing which which actually was somewhere in his heart and since after that he was Malala was relaxed because he had he had conceded what he's doing but he continued with his with his engagements with such years writings etc now the islam which we which he inherited and there comes this whole question of pluralism the whole inheritance Taqlid, uh, which uh, he inherited from, from his father, Maulana Azad wanted to get rid of it. He said, this is not the Islam I want to follow. There was a phase, almost six or seven years or eight years, where, and he has, Maulana himself has written about it, that I was, I was so disturbed that I didn't feel like saying my namaz. No, I didn't feel like actually going to a mosque. So he, he, he spent these, these years thinking about Islam 
so after a, a couple of years a refurbished islam came back to him he went back to islam but that islam was not the islam he inherited from from his father this was a islam which he kept all his life somewhere in his mind which was a islam that had scope for critical imagination that had scope for for doubt that had scope for questioning and this is what molana has written in so many of his writings that i islam is not a religion which which disallows you or which prohibits you to raise questions so i am not for going to follow islam where where a wahabi is turned out of, of my house i don't believe in wahhabiyat but i will not because he used to watch his father reprimanding a wahhabi turning a wahhabi out of his house in calcutta and one day some some old man uh, came and who was not was according to molana azad a very ugly looking man he was sitting somewhere in the house and uh, when molana entered he asked who is this man so molana azad's father said he is a wahhabi he said but i don't see his face is not black so because you have you have told that uh, wahhabis have a black face so his father says no his face is not black but his heart is black so this was a sort of antipathy towards wahhabism and this is a lesson which molana azad learned he said you may disagree with with a political ideology with with religious positions but you should not hate so don't take a position where where your mind stops working and you are blind you know you may you may not like wahhabiyat fine but you you should not hate anything you need to engage with anything which is happening around you so molana azad islam when it came back to him it came back with all these all these uh, doubts which is islam uh, allowed and he lived with that with that islam all his life so his pluralism in in approaching islam is reflected again in his tarjuman al quran because uh, in a, he began this project of translating quran and writing a commentary on quran in 1915 16 because uh, before that in 1912 maulana began al hilal now al hilal was a massive project a paper which uh, took the british and imperialism head on and he was not writing in al hilal only about imperialism in india he was writing about imperialism all over the islamic world how muslim societies have been impoverished imprisoned by colonial ideology so his writings were truly seditious according to the british and in alela so this paper went on for two years finally and i'm saying this because i will i'm going to tell you something else and which is very very important in molana azad's career he his paper is finally closed down fines are imposed and fines were so heavy that molana had to shut it down after few months he began al balagh different name but the same same job same contempt for imperialism so that he never never changed finally that also worked only for 6 or 7 months finally that was also stopped fine of 10000 rupees was imposed in those times which was impossible for molana to 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 deposit and he decided to shut it down both the papers had no sponsors molana used his own money resources to bring it out and i am saying this in today's context where we are living he said if you if i accept sponsorship i will have to follow the sponsors idea of islam of politics of life so i am not i will not allow or i will not permit anybody to to 
dictate anything to me. I want to be independent, so I will spend my own money. So, so this is something very important, which we have to keep in mind, particularly in what the India we are living in, the world we are living in rather. Now, once that is shut down, the intelligence files, which we have in the archives, which I have come across, the intelligence files declared Malana Azad in 19, 1916, 1916-17 as one of the most dangerous persons in India. Now, now I am saying this because by that time he has not even joined Congress party. He was not even in the ministry of freedom struggle. He got this tag as a journalist because it was his journalistic writings which which shook the British Empire and forced them to declare Maral Azad as one of the most dangerous persons in India. So journalism for him is is extremely important as a as, like as a vocation or as somebody who who came into public life journalism was something which which actually took him that far at a very young age now he is sent to murabadi a, a, a little village near ranchi interned for th three years were not uh, not allowed to and that was a place uh, the British chose that place because that was a tribal sort of area where uh, there was no mosque, no Muslims, nobody to incite. It was safe for the British that he will stay here, he won't do any mischief. And uh, it's good for him and good for the British. So for three years, he spent in that internment. Now, when he began writing his Tarjuman al Quran, that's what I wanted to come to, but I just gave this background. Uh, in 19. 16, and that was the, something which he began in Calcutta before he went to Ranchi. His house was raided by the British uh, police. All his records, papers, all taken away. Whatever he has written for the Jumal al Quran was destroyed. So, Maulana had no option what to do. Everything was destroyed. Finally, when he goes to Ranchi, and he thinks about it, what to do. You know, he has nothing else to do. He has to begin the project again. So he starts writing his Tarjuman al Quran again, writes, starts translation again, writes, starts his commentary again. This happens thrice. Twice his things were raided, taken away by the British. Third attempt, he could succeed. So a project which began in 1915-16 could end only in 1930 when he was in imprisoned in my city, Meerut, in a, in a jail in Meerut. That's where he finished, declared that his Quran is complete. 18 surahs, the full full Quran he couldn't complete, he couldn't get time to do it, but whatever he could do, he could finish it and publish it. So it took about, so while it was happening, he, he writes that I used to laugh at people like, uh, uh, that uh, forgot the name of the famous uh, British uh, author. Anyway, he wrote somewhere that uh, writing something again is the most difficult thing. And Maulana says, when I read this, I, I laughed. I said, how can you say this? You know, you can write whatever you want. I mean, you, it's all there in your mind. He said, when I faced this myself, then I realized how true that scholar was. It is such a difficult thing. But Maulana did go through this exercise and finally, now, when he begins, finishes his Tarjuman al-Quran, what is Tarjuman al-Quran? And here comes this whole idea of pluralism. Maulana, and I will not go into details, but they are there in the chapter. What he does is first, and this is something which he tried to unlearn from what he has learned from his father, that Islam is not the most a religion which is 
which should be put at the highest pedestal. Other religions are somewhere there. He said, this is the idea that Islam is the supreme religion. There is no other religion better than Islam. So all believers are told that Islam actually is the best religion. There is no other religion like, like Islam. Others may exist, but Islam is the best. Maulana writes, this is, this is not the idea to pursue any religion. You, you, have your own, you have your own faith. Islam is one of the many faiths in the world. A believer can have his own faith and they have their faith and they have a right to believe in what they what they what they have what they find in their book quran what they find in hadith what they find in islamic history but they have no business to even believe that islam is a religion much above anybody else any other religion so he takes a very comparative religious perspective where he is dealing with islam hinduism buddhism Christianity, Judaism, and even atheism, like quoting Bertrand Russell, who was not a believer. And so he quotes his philosophy, tries to engage with him. And, and this is something which I have pointed out in the book, why Maulana didn't talk about Charvaks, uh, our own atheists in Indian philosophy. The Charvaks are missing. Anyway, maybe he, he didn't have time or didn't get the idea of doing it. You could have done it. If you can quote Bertrand Russell as an atheist, you could have quoted Charvaks as well. But he is giving space to all of them. And space with respect that all of them, all these religions, people without religion, all of them have equal space in the world. So we should have respect, mutual respect, plurality, understanding, to accommodate all of them in this world. And that is the only possibility where you can expect some, some peace, some togetherness as believers. Once you start questioning each other or talking in terms of superiority for yourself, it is then that the question of, uh, of antipathy, of disagreement, of hatred comes in or germinates in your mind. So you should be a believer without the seeds of of hatred for, for the other. See, this othering of other religions, othering of human beings is the source of mischief. And so this is something which Maulana writes in detail. I'm just giving you briefly, you know, there are so many things he has said over there. Then uh, he uh, takes it forward as a as a, like, this is something which uh, which is important again in today's context of Islam, and I'm, uh, and this is not only in Tarjuman Quran. You know, Maulana makes comments on this particular issue in 1927, 26, 27, because the decades, decade of the 1920s, is a very, very, very important decade for for us. Because uh, lots of things happened in this period. And if you begin with non-cooperation movement, the first mass movement of Gandhi, 1925, founding of RSS, founding of Communist Party of India, 1925, the same year. You have this phase of the revolutionaries, which is not important for us here, but important for me because I have done lots of things on that particular phase. 1926, Bhagat Singh and his comrades, they 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 established Naujwan Bharat Sabha and all sorts of things. Same period sees the founding of Tablighi Jamaat by Maulana Muhammad Elias in 1928-29. So, 1920s is a, is a very, very important phase for us. Now, in this particular period, after the non-cooperation movement failure, there is a huge communal upsurge all over North India in particular. And in that phase, there is a hatred towards Islam. Are Samaji groups in particular in Punjab, they bring out a large number of very scandalous books about Islam. And one of the one of the one of the books which I want to refer here is Rangila Rasul. And that book came out in 1924-25 by by uh, by a Swami. And the whole 
Punjab, Holo Punjab was up in arms against uh, against that book, and there was violence, killings, riots all over. Maulana Azad was about to finish his Tarjuman Quran. He was in that phase, and he says, "What is this? I I hate the idea, the scandalous work which has been done by by this uh, priest against the Prophet." No, it's disgusting. It shouldn't have been written. But I am more disgusted by the reaction. Why the Muslims have to come out and kill others, kill innocent people? This is all this on record. You know, he says it so so categorically that you Muslims have no business to come out and kill innocent people because somebody has insulted their prophet. So Maran Azad had that space. And this is this is how his politics was. So he openly writes about it in, in, in quite quite detail. So when we see violence today, we have to we have to learn some lesson from Allah Azad if you want to really, because I I don't see um, uh, a semi literate uh, Maulana who, who, who issues fatwas in the name of Islam. No, I, if I have to believe a, a, a scholar, Islamic scholar, I, I will believe in uh, follow what Maulana Azad wrote. You know? Because if you want to question him, then you have to really question him seriously. You know? So, so that is something which uh, all of us need to need to keep in mind, and that is that is how uh, Maulana Azad's importance uh, we see in our in our world today. He takes this this whole idea forward in his in his politics because uh, when he comes out of uh, three years of uh, internment uh, from Rachi, and he has written himself, he said, "I had two options. One option was that I go somewhere in the corner and continue my scholarship of Islam, keep writing." Another was to plunge myself into into politics against against British imperialism. And so, while I was going through this struggle, I decided to take the second option and plunge myself into into politics. Now, on 18 January 1920, because he comes out, he was released in 1919, but he didn't come out. He stayed in Ranchi for a few more days came out finally in January. On 18 January 1920, he meets Gandhi for the first time. That is his first meeting. And Gandhi tells him that, uh, Maulana, I wanted to meet you uh, in 1919, in the middle, when I went to somewhere close to Ranchi. I went almost to the place where you were, but the British didn't allow me to meet you. So, so I missed that opportunity, but now, I'm very happy that we meet each other. So this is the beginning of his association with Mahatma Gandhi. And that is something which lasted forever till the end. Now, once he joins the Congress party, he becomes uh, one of the key players of the Congress party. Within three years, in 1923, now this is again his you know, his Islam and his approach towards Islam, his approach towards different religions, that is reflected in his politics also. His scholarship, his teacher. In 1923, he joins Congress in 20, 1923, a special session of the Congress party is organized in Delhi. And Congress party was going through a crisis in 1923. There was a group of people, no changes or pro changes, Mutalan Lehru, Siyar Das, and, and others. One, one group wanted assembly entry, another group wanted uh, not, not to enter the assembly. So this was a debate. And Congress was almost on the verge of split. Now, at that moment, and now this is something so important in the life of Maulana, that the whole Congress party decided that it is only Maulana Abul Kalam Azad who can be a Congress president at this time of crisis who can bring the two factions together. And he was 
invited to to be the Congress president of a special session. The his speech, presidential speech, is classic. We go through and read it. It's a such a whatever he wrote was poetic, and so this speech was so important. And his role, which was expected by the Congress party, he fulfilled that role, brought those two factions together, and the Congress party remained one. So this is something. And his age was 35, youngest Congress president ever. Nobody became Congress president president at the age of 30, 35. So that was something special which he did. And uh, he wrote in. He said in that uh, in that uh, presidential address, which are classic words, which we you must have read uh, those words because they are quoted quite often. He said. And I'm quoting this because we talk of pluralism, we talk of Maulana's secularism, his commitment to different religions. He says that even if a, 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 an angel comes from, from heaven uh, and lands and tells us that you, you will get freedom today if you give up the idea of Hindu-Muslim togetherness, I will say no to that freedom if that freedom comes at the cost of Hindu-Muslim unity. So this was the sort of commitment which Malana had in 1923. Now people talk about all sorts of things, you know, whatever he wrote in the beginning, because there was a phase of Malana just a few years before where he is talking about about jihad, about Hezbollah. You know, uh, we found a group of Hezbollah, a large number of people joined that in, in Calcutta. But that was a passing phase. Aisha Jalal has uh, referred to it, uh, where uh, I've disagreed in the book, you know, the whole idea is very different. But this was a phase which Marana transcends and comes into an integrative phase, where Islam is not important alone. Islam remains his faith all his life. But when it comes to politics, he he takes up integrative politics where there is an idea of togetherness. And this is something which I have talked about in this chapter on nationalism. Because this book is will not find a very chronological idea of Maulana Azar's political life. Because I go back and forth because I'm more interested in Maulana's, Maulana's ideas, whether it is religious ideas or political ideas. So when he, in the chapter on nationalism, Maulana talks about uses Islam as a and he's not the first one who is doing it and I will tell you how people have others have done it he says that Muslims in this country have to work with with the majority Hindus when it comes to politics when it comes to fight against against the British and for this they don't have to they don't have to bother at all because for them, the lesson is there in their history of Islam itself, in the life of the Prophet himself. Go back to the first Islamic state, which was formed in Medina by the Prophet Muhammad. The Quraysh, the Ansars and the Jews, they all got together to form the first Islamic state under the leadership of, of Prophet Muhammad. If he could do it in 7th century, why can't Muslims do it today? So, so that so there is an example uh, from the history of Islam. This is how Maulana begins. The similar example is given by Usain Ahmad Madni in his writings. There is a debate which I have discussed in the book, and which is important for Maulana's politics also. The debate between Alama Iqbal and Usain Ahmad Madni in 1938. Alama Iqbal writes. And this is something which uh, I think some researcher should take up. I am not competent to do, do that. But somebody has to take up this whole issue of relationship of Allama Iqbal and Maulana Azad. There is nothing much written about it. It's very, very uh, enigmatic for me because uh, there's something which they were, they were contemporaries. Both of them were Islamic scholars. Both were literary figures. But they never, they never exchanged a word with each other, though they lived in the same world. There is no there is no evidence of any letter which they wrote to each other. 
or responded to each other on any philosophical or literary uh, issue which is this is strange neither molana nor alam ikbal this is what i know but some scholar can explore further anyway when he in 1938 alam ikbal talks about islamic nationalism where he says that is this whole idea which people like molana azad is not naming him but uh, he says people talk about composite nationalism islam has no place of composite nationalism islam is a religion which which is not territorial territorial nationalism has no place in islam because islam is a cosmopolitan religion islam has is religion without boundaries now the man and i am surprised that somebody who is who is a who is a trained philosopher who is a who is a trained scholar studied from heidelberg lived in europe somebody like him and and a literary figure how can somebody like him say something like this because he he should know that islam religion and 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 identity nationalism they are two different things because if you if you believe in this that you can you can um, like use uh, religion and nationalism as interchangeable uh, things then why why there are, there are so many uh, islamic nations with one religion no lots of people asked alama iqbal in those times if you are saying this then even the arab world which have the same language same religion but different nations which means that you cannot really use this as interchangeable category husain ahmed madni questions that writes a treatise on composite nationalism in urdu which was translated into english later on which is a beautiful text where uh, he makes a difference between qaum and millat maulana alama iqbal says that millat alama iqbal says qaum is something where there is no religion qaum can be qaum is qaum religion can be hindu christian whatever millat is something else no so i am not saying this is what uh, alama iqbal accuses husain ahmed madni said i am using qaum in a different category you know millat is something else so you are talking of something else in this debate alama iqbal goes to the extent of calling husain ahmed madni abu lahab now look at the level of hatred you know so th- th- this was a uh, something in 1938 and that is unfortunately the year when alama iqbal passed away and the debate couldn't continue but this is important for molana azad and this politics because th- it was happening almost at the same time when molana is trying to define his own nationalism indivisible nationalism composite nationalism trying to find a place for islam in the nationality which was being defined in india and i have tried to say that uh, molana azad people like azad people like nehru patel gandhi they were actually confronting two forces at the same time rather three forces at the same time they were not confronting the british alone they were fighting the hindu and muslim communalists yeah. their fight was three pronged because they had to they were and molana has written about it uh, and i have raised it in this chapter on nationalism is i can understand the the uh, politics of muslim league muslim league wants to create a nation in the name of religion one can understand clearly but what is the problem of hindu nationalists hindu communalists they should they should they should have no problems because they should be part of the congress if they are nationalists we are all nationalists why are they why are they uh, talking in terms of uh, a separate uh, hindu identity muslim identity one, one can understand we can know their politics so this is molana writes in detail so many places which i have used in his in this in this book as well and it is difficult to explain in those times because uh, one can see why why all this was happening and molana was somewhere in the in the heart 
of all this politics because as a as a muslim leader which he himself found very very uncomfortable because uh, after independence uh, there was news which was spread and some people say and my, my dear friend uh, late uh, rizwan qasar uh, he wrote also in his book that uh, when the new government was being formed molana was told that he is being included in the cabinet as a muslim representative on the muslim quota and i am raising this because here you can see what was molana's position he said what do you mean by muslim quota i am not a muslim leader if i had been a muslim leader i would have been in muslim league and standing with mohammad ali jinnah i led hindus and muslims together you know i am a leader of this country so it, there was something something you know true or false whatever but within four or five days he came to realize that this was something wrong nehru probably explained to him and others also talked to him so this was something which molana himself did not accept he ex- he saw himself as a leader who stood for a united india and never saw himself as just just a muslim leader now in this particular phase we find that after even after independence because uh, there's a lot lot lots of things which one could say but i should not continue because it will go on endlessly uh but after independence uh the task of building a new india was taken up honestly by people like molana azad because he had three three departments important ones education science and culture now his pluralism his his uh, uh openness comes into play when he takes up the task of building a new india he goes to patna in 1947 immediately after he takes over to deliver a conv- convocation address in the patna university now he begins by saying excuse me because i am going to speak in urdu convocation addresses are generally delivered in english because this whole idea of a modern university in those days there was nobody who used to speak in urdu or hindi or hindi there was no question urdu was a possibility but even urdu was not used so he begins by saying that and then starts by saying all sorts of things important thing was he says that we have gained independence but this is not enough we have to give up we have to give up uh, that is some something very important ha huh? we have to give us give up blind adherence to anything whether in religion politics or or or, or any, any knowledge for that or that matter we have to keep our minds open only an open mind only a mind which has space for anything to acquire from anywhere we have to keep our windows open so gives a detailed sort of lecture on languages he says our language has been english during the british time since macaulay so we have to create our own own languages promote our own languages now again see his his accommodation for for uh, for english at that time he says we have to create space for our languages but english is in a language which is international language we 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 cannot just shun english by by just switching switching off our system we have to do it gradually so translate things into into our own languages keep keep space for english and then create conditions where so this is how he began and this is 1947 and then the whole the period like there's a whole section in the book on equity in education he says our our languages our knowledge has been enclaved large sections of our population 
have been deprived of of education from centuries we have deprived a section of our population of knowledge all that should stop the the colonial government in 200 years made things even worse so equity not equality equity is important so he delivers lots of convocation addresses cave meetings where, where, whenever he got the opportunity to talk about the first thing he emphasized was equity in education everybody should get an equal opportunity access whether it is gender whether it is class religion or community all of them should get equal opportunity that was the beginning he tried to make as a minister second thing was those were difficult times after partition there was a huge challenge and i have devoted a whole section on that how the 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 refugees who came from from across the border they were finding terrible problems in finding schools colleges people have lost their degrees certificates when they came back everything was burnt so everything has to be created anew and molana formed a committee large number of people were involved in that so that was another task which lasted for 2 years because people say all sorts of things that what was done in that period we should also realize that that period was not a normal period that was a difficult time where india has to be built in a, in in times where life was not so easy budget if you read and i have given some statistics here the budget was today one will laugh how can a ministry will have can have a budget like peanuts no there was hardly any money and molana complains in the parliament in constituent assembly debates that you cannot build because i he says and he has said it very clearly he said i i find budget money for education more important than for economic and industrial development because economic and industrial development can wait education cannot but anyway these things were said but uh, not everything was followed uh, so seriously because Nehru, as a as a prime minister of this country, uh, had his own idea of development. Who was a someone who was a man in a hurry, uh, who believed that we lag behind the world and we have to cover lots of space, which was true to a great extent. That was the foundation which he laid and the foundation on which we have built this country. So Malana was was in agreement with Nehru on so many counts on that on that uh, on that issue. so that was a period where you had culture the british had no idea that indian music indian indian literature uh, indian art uh, has any space but they didn't build any institution so molana felt the necessity of setting up sangeet natak academy sahitya academy lalit kala academy they were all set up by molana azad and uh, yeah and uh, while doing it particularly setting up sangeet natak academy there is one very interesting uh, interesting thing which i have noted here in the book also in 1948 or 47 later 47 he wrote a letter to to sardar patel who was a minister for information broadcasting also besides the home minister he says in that letter that uh, sardar i am writing this to you and don't mind my interference in your ministry but i am writing this because uh, i i hear the olander olander radio programs on indian classical music they are awful no they are very substandard and i think we need to do something about it if you don't have time i am i am ready to devote time please send the person who is in charge of this department to me i will spend some time with him so that the standards of indian classical music are are improved so this is the level of molana's participation in building institutions like he 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 was not uh, like uh, somebody who was running a ministry without being aware of what is happening around around him he knew what is happening and he knew how he he need to participate or involve people so there are lots of things which i could have said i skipped the wabare khatir section because they could have taken a little more time a little more than uh, required thank you very much for uh, listening to what i have said it was a very very 
freewheeling sort of introduction of the book. But I, I hope you must have got something to take it forward and uh, inspired you enough to go and buy the book. Thank you. Oh, Professor Nirvan, I, I mean, you somehow you skipped that part, in fact, but you see, one question always, you know, perturbs me. That Allama Iqbal, you see, I, you know, I love Allama Iqbal from the bottom of my heart, you see. He, that conversation remained unfinished, you see, when he died in 1938, you see, I understand. Uh, and he was... Uh, a uh, organizer of pan-Islamism and he was great follower of Jamaluddin Afghani and you see his last book you know which was Javed Nama and, and he travels around along with Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi and then talks about pan-Islamism and Khilafat and that's all. First what made Gandhi to join this campaign? To become part of, you see, people say that because, you see, Muslims, to bring Muslims to the fore of, you know, uh, independence movement, uh, one answer is given. But another one is, what was the reaction of Maulana at that very point of time when he was completely away, rather pulls apart, you see, from the ideologies of Allah Muhammad. That's how, do we, do you find some reaction from Maulana Azad that, look, I mean, this is not the time when Gandhi should join this campaign, which is not really conducive for the health of Indian national movement. This is how, you see, it, it, it perturbs me, in fact. And if you have any answer, you see, not, you see, I'm not posing any question, rather, if you could convince me or convince the audience, in fact, this is always in our mind, you see. What happened, you see, because the conflict of ideas, you know, this is there. That's how you, we are questioning that what happened. And even RSS is also questioning Gandhi, what made him to join? And what was the reaction of Maulana Azad at that very point of time? That has to be made very clear. This is how you see my observation. Yeah. 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 There are many such questions uh, which need to be raised, and particularly when we are uh, uh, still in nature, we are here with the author. So we will be posing many such questions, expecting more informed answer from the author who has got so extensively on the person we are talking about. Uh, uh, there could be many, many questions. For example, Azad was influenced with uh, such a religious uh, view, uh, republicanism, but not with uh, his politics. But did Azad really articulate his idea that he conquered with uh, such a Islamic reformism? 
was a different uh, uh, on a diff on a different plane lala lajpat rai raised a question that we are not afraid of the 7 crore muslims of india but once they join with the west asian muslims and all other muslim country then hindu really becomes minority and therefore the hindu fear of uh, muslim minority should not be dismissed and post khilafat there emerged a very big challenge of 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 uh, hindu muslim unity because they they started going all apart so whether on these issues azad uh, really uh, articulated his position as adequately as he should have so we have many more questions for pre independence period as also for post independence period also we just hope that we will be discussing all these things in the next two days with sir two minutes of course sir yeah. <coughs> see uh, <coughs> when we talk about uh, maulana's position on <coughs> on uh, like jamaluddin afghani was named i have, i have worked on jamaluddin afghani separately in a in a book jihad aur istihad which i did in 2012 <clears throat> that was in the context of science but here also you see molana is one person who is influenced by both sar sayed and jamaluddin afghani though sar sayed and jamaluddin afghani were betanoa they were they hated each other sar sayed never mentioned afghani's name ever they were contemporaries like uh, afghani comes to india in earlier also but 1880s is a is a trip which is very very important 1880 to 1882 that is when he goes to calcutta he goes to hyderabad he, he, he comes here uh, and he uh, spends time in uh, other parts of this thing and delivers lectures now he writes a, a book in india while he is here where he is not mentioning sar sayed's name but that book actually is against sar sayed and this whole idea of supporting the british because that jamaluddin afghani is a pan islamist now when he comes to india he forgets pan islamism now here he sees that in in india for anti imperialist battle you need to collaborate with the majority hindus so muslims alone have no 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 actually place if 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 they have to fight against the british so they have to be fighting it to, uh, together so he speaks in calcutta in 1881 and there there are about 300 people young young people sitting in front of him he speaks in persian so 
most of the people sitting over there were Persian uh, speaking, understanding people, mostly Muslims, because he is he's addressing uh, the Muslim cause. He himself is is a is a Muslim scholar, so you don't expect anybody else to be there. There is no inventory of who was there, but we expect that they were all Muslims. Now, what he says, Avani says that you, young people, are inheritors of the knowledge system, which which invented zero, which invented l lots of things which uh, which uh, indian ancient indian knowledge system has given to the world so what is he saying he is saying this to the young muslims sitting in front of him telling them to re remind themselves of the idea of zero where islam was not even born in those times so he forgot about about faith about islam about religion or identity he talks about nationality he goes beyond religious identity and f tries to inform people that you have to fight together as a nation against the British, against imperialism. So, so this is something which is very different from Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. There, was, there were two different fights going on at that time. Sir Sayyid had, had a different agenda. Sir Sayyid was an Indian. His idea was to talk about Indian Muslims and their vocation, their life, their problems, their issues. while. Jamaluddin Afwani was a peripatetic Islamic scholar who was traveling from Iran to Turkey to India to all of the parts, you know, and and speaking about the the subjugation of, of Muslims against European nations. So on that count, we see that Maulana Azad is impressed by both Sir Sayyid for different reasons, Jamaluddin Afwani for different reasons. He agrees with Jamaluddin Afghani that we have to fight the British. So anti-imperialism is very dear to him. And he agrees with him. So he carries both of them together. A time comes when he dissociates himself with Sir Sayyid's politics. And politics of Aligarh Tahrik. And when he goes to Aligarh in 1949 as a minister to address a convocation address, he knows that he has come to a place where he is hated. Because Maulana Azad has stood always against the politics of Aligarh uh, Tahrik. And he begins that convocation address by saying that you may not like the idea of Aligarh I had in mind, the, the politics I had been talking about all these years, but all that is our past. For you as well as for me, we have to build a new India and that we have to do together. We have to build new India as Indian nationals. So. We all have to come together, forget about past, all that is gone. So this is how Maulana Azad tries to explain uh, this whole idea of fight for India together, build building of India together.